here we are on the, what is today? Monday evening here on the Pacific Northwest coast. Um, and I think 11 PM on the East coast of the U S and whatever time it is in Thailand, I'm not sure. Um, but Naveed just asked a great question. Um, he was mentioning that he hears Damarado talking through Anapanasati and mentions the phrase on occasion, I see you Mara. And he was just asking where meditation fits into the practice. Um, and uh, Brett and I were actually having a conversation, I think, related to this a little bit earlier today. Um, so I have some things that I can say yeah. in response to that. Um, but uh, Brett, I, if you want to, if you want to respond first, I'm totally fine with that. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is just yes. Um, to meditation factors in exactly there. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have right mindfulness. Michael and I were referring to that as a stream of unbroken sati or mind, right mm -hmm. mindfulness that continues throughout the day mm -hmm. uh, with the wholesome intent of spotting dukkha as it arises. Oh. And so that I see you, Mara, is very precisely the Anapanasati. And we, turn, we return to this very breath and we use the breath as an anchor. Mm hmm this process yeah well put um i like to think of the breath as a mnemonic device um you know a memory device something that keeps us reminded uh which is what sati means is to recollect or to remember mm -hmm. um and the way that damarado teaches meditation or teaches the practice i'll say he always says that he teaches the structure of the anapanasati sutta uh, through the framework of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, and I used to not understand exactly what he meant by that. And then I went and kind of did a deep dive in some of his past videos where he used um, MN117, the framework of the Noble Eightfold Path, um, you know, with the additional two fruitions um, in conjunction with Anapanasati. And I, I sort of started to understand that he's been doing that the whole time. But... What I want to say to your question specifically is that, um, you know, meditation is a, an English word. Um, mm -hmm. Buddhism came to the U.S. first through, uh, you know, expats uh, from Japan uh, prior to and during World War II. And, you know, as you know, Zen um, emphasizes that eighth factor of the Noble Eightfold uh, Path, and they, they formalize it pretty that's a pretty formal structured practice. Uh, there's also the exposure to different yogas in India that came to the West. So we associate meditation with, you know, a formal posture um, for a certain amount of time. Um, <clears throat> but um, there's two different words that are associated with meditation in the suttas. One is uh, samadhi, uh, which is the eighth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, and the other is bhavana. Um, which is the duty that the Buddha gives to the fourth noble truth. Um, so the word bhavana means to cultivate, um, to develop, mm -hmm. and that's the duty to the fourth noble truth, that we're, our duty is to develop all eight factors of the noble eightfold path. Um, and like a chemical equation, when those, when those factors are developed together, um, they have the result of extinguishing suffering, uh, opening up the Dhamma eye, things like that. Um, and the way that um, Samadhi is taught in MN117 is noble right Samadhi with its seven supporters, right? So, and Buddha Dasa actually spoke of Samadhi in the same way. Um, so Samadhi is sometimes translated as meditation, sometimes translated as um, concentration. And... Um, but what the word samadhi uh, means is sort of like gathered together. And what's gathered together in that eighth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is the previous seven factors of the path. So when, the first, when, when factors one through seven are gathered together um, and held together continuously in the same way that memory holds together our whole cognitive system, right? Um, if any of you guys have studied cognitive psychology or, you know, theories of perception, we have sensory memory, we have working memory, and we have long-term memory. Um, and memory is actually what stitches together, what holds together our experience of the world. 
sensory memory is what makes sense experience feel continuous. Working memory is what makes it so that when we take one step forward, we don't forget the last step. <laughs> and then, of course, long-term memory is what makes our life feel whole. Um, so sati is memory in the Noble Eightfold Path, and it's what holds the other factors together. Um, so right over right samadhi is those other seven factors gathered together. And like I said uh, before, it's it's like chemistry. Um, it 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 brings it brings dukkha to cessation when it's put together right. So that's what you're that's what Damarado is doing. He's he's taking uh, what he calls high flu high uh, pollutant language of the suttas and the way they've been translated. It's also archaic language. Pali is a dead language. It's old. Um, it's like if we were speaking to each other in Latin, um, language, words lose their meaning over time. And he puts it into such um, tangible forms that sometimes it's offensive to us. Um, and this is actually a topic I was thinking about for today, but it's related to your question, um, is uh, Damarado's version of the Four Noble Truths, um, which is, he says, um, life sucks because we're sucking. So if we stop sucking, life won't suck anymore, right? Um, yeah. And the, uh -huh. I heard him say that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then he relates it to the fact that um, <laughs> the only thing we can do as a baby is suck, right? Um, and that's a perfect illustration of craving because craving is an unconscious evolutionary drive, right? It's our right. it's our pressure to to get the things we want, our resistance to the things that we don't want, and our confusion about the things that don't have a pleasant or unpleasant uh, sensation to them. So life sucks. We're dissatisfied. That's the first noble truth. Because we're sucking, uh, that's the second noble truth. We're wanting things we don't have. We're wanting to get rid of things that we don't like. Um, we're feeling confused about things we don't understand. Um, and then stop sucking. That's the third noble truth, right? The cessation of craving and dukkha. And then the fourth noble truth is, you know, uh, the culmination of the path is life won't suck anymore. <laughs> um, so that's that's what Damarada is trying to get across to us is stop wanting things that we don't have. Um, stop being dissatisfied with the way things are. Um, you can, you know, pay attention continually throughout the day, as Brett was mentioning, that continuity of sati, steady stream of sati. Um, and that's during what, the night. And during the night. It, it eventually does make its way into, into your sleep as well, actually, yeah. Um, that continuity of sati. So it's all, it's all meditation. Yeah, I mean, that's the short version. Um, I see, I see. Well, go on, go on. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was going to say the second, the second, the second Damarado-ism for a little later in case it comes up. But um, um, the other thing that he says that I think is even more offensive, um, but is I went back into his old videos and I found out the origin of this. But he tells us that um, if we don't want to suffer, we shouldn't care about anything or anyone. And we just stop caring because mm -hmm. the uh, caring is carrying, right? And then I was like, okay, finally, I heard him say once that he started saying in one of his older videos, he started telling us carrying because the word clinging is intangible to us. We don't really feel anything. We're told not to cling. Um, but when you say like, you know, carrying or I don't care, you know, so he uses the word carrying in place of clinging. So, um, you know, uh, the Buddha right. summarizes dukkha as the five aggregates afflicted by clinging. So... Uh, when we're sort of carrying and carrying things around, um, that's that's another way that he illustrates yeah. suffering. Go ahead, Brett. Well, could it be that detachment is the gateway to Karina and compa compassion? Sorry about the poly, about my bad. But I mean, could it be then that a certain type of detachment that gets rid of selfishness and gets rid of the t craving, almost said time, the craving <laughs> inherent in our approach to other then is the gateway to compassion Sim as emptiness is the gateway to unity or oneness um i mean yeah in a sense oh, just maybe in a well, sense you know so one thing i can say and um, this is another thing i'm stealing directly from Domorado actually i'm borrowing a lot from Domorado today <laughs> is um he said you know to make a distinction between caring about and caring for right so if somebody right. has a sick puppy that they care about 
and they bring that sick puppy to the vet and they're crying uh, because they care about that puppy. But the vet doesn't care about the puppy, but the vet has, you know, knowledge and, and wisdom and know-how and will care for the puppy. Um, and that vet can actually help the puppy with their knowledge and their mindfulness. Um, Perhaps so they care for all puppies. Yeah, they care for all of Perhaps the in a way. animals that come into their office. I mean, we could use a doctor or a humanist if they want to. So um, you could say that, you know, when you cross a certain threshold in the practice where um, that evolutionary programming of craving and clinging no longer becomes what pushes and pulls us to do things out of selfishness, um, what then replaces that, for one, is the Noble Eightfold Path becomes our operating system but also um, mindfulness and wisdom. We, we base our choices on, um, you know, paying close attention to the way things are uh, with, with our knowledge of the, the Four Noble Truths always operating in the background. Um, so that's the, that's the skillful means that we then live our life by um, so that our choices are driven by, by wisdom rather than by... Um, Selfishness, you know, selfishness takes the form of fear, um, jealousy, yeah. greed, uh, identity. I, activism is, is an example that I, I used in, in my thesis that, you know, most activism, if you, it may look nice from the outside, but if you go and you hang out with activists, you see there's a lot of egoism, there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of fear, anger. there's a lot of anger, yeah, there's a lot of clinging, um, and it's just, um, you know, the mind that created the problem is not the mind that's going to solve the problem type of situation. There's not a lot of um, rational detachment, as we say in the teaching profession, in activism. Um, so, yeah, I guess the art is, is um, going from craving and clinging, um, attachments to who and what you think you are, uh, attachments to beliefs and conventions of your culture that second fetter rights rules and rituals um and then doubt you know uh, just not quite knowing what to do what's appropriate um instead of sort of being stuck in that or even the late the, the higher two fetter the next two which is you know um uh, sensual desire and ill will instead of those things being uh what drive your behavior you you use you use um mindfulness and wisdom or knowledge and vision to to uh have compassion um after this i'll send you guys i've sent it to brett already and um but seminary jaya sara's reading of one of tiknat han's poems i think is the best illustration of um of just the the, the full breadth of the brahma viharas um because uh i can't say it as good as as it's expressed in that in that poem so i'll send that afterwards just for you guys to enjoy <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I've listened to a lot of her stuff, which is amazing. The way she, uh, like, you can listen to the whole thing. I mean, I've listened to a lot of Hindu stuff and this and that, but um, also a lot of Buddhist things. Yeah, um, listening to Nisargadatta through Samaneri Jayasara's voice, and then going and listening to Nisargadatta. It is like live <laughs> um, <laughs> night and day, huh? What are they called yeah. again? Sat songs. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. But anyway. Good example. Yeah. Of, yeah, that's anyway. I find benefit in seminary Jayasara. Or every listening time. to uh listening to Ajahn uh long long time Mahabua's um, you know, crying in the marvel of the Dhamma talk from Samaneri Jayasara's reading of it and then going and watching a video of him crying and spitting beetle nut and like just like Leoline, <laughs> you know, like emotionally. <laughs> I saw that too. Yeah. But you know, th those things are good because it dispels our yeah. idea of what like somebody who's much further along uh in the in the cultivation of the Dhamma than we are uh yeah. actually looks like. Um the, there's there's so much character and personality that still remains. Um, so anyway, the odor of the jar is still on them. Yeah, yeah. 
what do they they always say that the Taiyajans and the foresters and they always say like a like a somebody who has sort of like a short angry seeming character will still have that character as an arahat somebody who's like very um like soft spoken and patient um will still have that as an arahat cuz you know um what's um i guess the modes of expression are not given up it's more so like um you know all the things that we carry that's that's given up along the way not necessarily how we express ourselves and communicate and that's the the or the the cultural framework for for which we can but anyway that's a that's a that's a, almost yeah. a pointless topic to go down that road it's still right intention and a pure chita so we're told in that situation it's inspirational to to contemplate to a certain degree. It's wholesome. Yeah, I, th- I mean, it's but, almost funny. It's almost like the better teachers know um, what type of tone to use to their audience, whereas uh-huh. somebody who's just like really purified but not a great teacher will kind of just always be, you know, in that wholesome state, um, and will display anger and things like that. But anyway, like I said, that's not that's not a super useful topic in my no. experience to uh, to contemplate. I'm holding back a sneeze. <laughs> One phrase I've heard Damaranto use more frequently lately is what a relief it is or wow what a relief and you know the the relief is from stress or from dissatisfaction or from uh carrying what's heavy right and uh yeah this phrase has uh, really made it so simple for me lately. And uh, I've also been seeing in uh, Thanissaro's uh, translations, he'll use the word stress instead of dukkha uh, many times. And just this idea that dukkha naroda is, you know, there is stress, there is relief from stress. (laughs) I mean, that almost sounds like... uh, uh, a scientific uh, equation or something about. like this, you know, just like a, a part of physics, you know, it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> duh, like there's, you know, things can be stressed, things can be relieved of stress. <laughs> so that's what we're practicing, right, is stress relief. You know, dissatisfaction that we're experiencing is stressing us out. <laughs> no, it really is. I mean, that's true. It's just you don't realize it until you give up your desire or something and suddenly you realize, wow, I was stressed to the max. I didn't even I mean not so stressed that you it's life and death, but it's right. a, a total feeling of unease. I hear I hear the four noble truths in both of you guys' expressions. You know, uh, it really is an equation. You know, it is. I call yeah. it the liberation equation. Duca, Duca, and Rhoda. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've heard you say that before. I like that. <laughs> I, um, I really do too. But um, this is why the whole Dhamma Chakra Pawatana Sutta is so important because the Buddha also attaches a duty to each of the four noble truths, and the the duty to the third is significant, which is to realize. Right, uh, Dukkha Naroda, meaning that, and B- Buddha also pointed this out a lot. This is one thing he really fixated on, or or taught a lot, I should say, um, is that we experience little nibbanas all day. If we didn't, we would go absolutely freaking insane. We just don't pay attention to it. We don't realize it. You know, even somebody who has like a generalized anxiety disorder, they are just their their perception is selecting. The moments of high stress and anxiety and it's omitting all of the moments of relief so not just like oh what a relief it is but like 
acknowledging and realizing and delighting in relief, uh, we have to train the mind to delight in niroda, which is relief, right? Or quenching, as Buddha also calls it. Um, and instead of delighting in stress, because all sensory um, pleasure is stressful. Um, when you understand uh, sensuality properly, um, you understand that actually um, everything that we pursue is to relieve the patterns of tension that the body creates in order to drive us towards something. There's actually a great theory in psychology, and like you get it in your, um, I taught like one year of high school psychology because the, the psychology teacher had quit, so they gave it to me. But there's this theory, drive, and I taught it the, the year I came back from Swan Milk, and it just looked like pure Dhamma to me. There's this theory called drive reduction theory. Um, and the theory is that fundamentally um, that we have these drives inside of us that create unpleasant sensations, patterns of tension that are created by hormones released into the blood from the limbic system. And um, we pursue relief. So when you're hungry, hunger is a drive, um, and then you eat to relieve your hunger. Um, sex, you know, being horny, um, reproductive instinct, I like to call it, at the drive, and then you pursue masturbation or intercourse in order to relieve that that uncomfortable feeling that's in the body. Um, you know, and then everything else we do, there's there's uh, patterns of tension that the body creates, and then we go to relieve it. So sensuality is this trap of of pursuing objects in order to relieve tension in the body. And what the Buddha is telling us with that third noble truth is actually what we can do is keep the body in a continuous state of relaxation so there's no pressure to relieve it. And then, but what we have to do is see that that's the real happiness in life of just being free of desire, being free of that pressure, being free of that stress. Uh, that was just the word we call that bodily tension. Um, and all of the meanings and stories and belief systems that we attach to that, just that basic fundamental pattern of stress and relief, um, we base everything off of it. <laughs> um, and you can kind of test how attached you are to these, right? Have you ever contemplated what it would be like to uh, be put in solitary confinement? Like, have you ever just like sat and thought about it? You'd be like, okay, you think you tell yourself, I'd be okay. I'm just going to sit here, <laughs> right? Um, I've, been, I've been in solitary confinement, Michael. Oh, have you? <laughs> yeah. <Really? laughs> yeah. It, it, and my mind state was challenging at the time. So, you know, I was having neurological problems at the time. So it, it wouldn't be as pleasurable as it would be now. I think it, but at the same time, you know, if I were to voluntarily do it, it would be different. So I, now I could, I imagine it as a, as a, a nice place to practice. Um, but my yeah. memories weren't quite the same. But go, I was ahead, gonna go on. I was going to suggest not that it would be pleasurable, but but for most people, it would drive them insane. Um, Absolutely, because you know you'd have all these patterns of of tension, all these pressures uh, that the mind creates, and the only way to relieve it is with your imagination. But that eventually would become unsatisfying, right? Imagine, I mean, for most people, like solitary confinement feels like like psychological torture. Um, um and so so that's the danger of samsara is what i'm trying to say you know that's the danger okay. of being stuck in this stuck in this cycle of like all the meaning and all the pleasure we get in life yeah we a second my phone did with the four noble truths we can exit that feedback loop mm -hmm. and with our cl clinging and our craving to the pleasures we get through the five clinging aggregates, we again and again reify that feedback, or we reify that feeding. So every time we indulge and try to sate the burning of that tanha, that craving, we actually make it worse. You know, we make we make our hunger greater uh, unless we find refreshment, unless we train the mind to seek calm. And relinquish and find that cooling datu of the third noble truth. So we train the mind. And the eighth path factor, samadhi, 
was determined was designed by the Buddha in my view as a method to feel the removal of the psychic irritants and then we can know the absence of dukkha so sometimes the best way to experience dukkha as dhamma vidu pointed out in his talks is to experience its absence and then when it returns we can notice it on more and more subtle levels even in the first tetrad even breathing in and breathing out and experiencing this very breath Well, yes. Um, the first tetrad is extremely significant um, because by the end of the first tetrad, you have a a completely relaxed body. I was going to say tranquilized body, but uh, I know Domerado hates that term. <laughs> We're but still you have a completely alert. relaxed body, um, so you're you're actually free of that that drive that's normally pushing you around in your life. Um, and you're able to observe the relationship between tension in the body and feelings in the mind and mental states and how they interact with each other um, and how pleasurable it is to be free of all that. Um, Precisely. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's sort of like you're coming out of the water for the first time. You've been in the world of sensuality of stress and stress and, and going after objects to experience the relief from that stress. Um, but now you're experiencing the cessation of stress um, without, you know, obtaining an object. Um, so it's like when the frog from the tadpole becomes a frog. Um, uh, hang on a second. Hey, Ivan. Welcome. Hello, Ivan. Uh, yeah, good to see you, Ivan. Yeah, hi. I was... Because I was sleeping, and then I was inside my dream. I was listening uh, to Michael's Dharma talk. Like, <laughs> even though I miss it, it's so funny. Like, why would that happen? <laughs> right. There's no reason. Yeah. <laughs> But so can you guys honestly say that you can be in solitary confinement? See, I thought the same thing myself. I'm like, oh, I know how to meditate. So I heard a joke. Somebody said, yeah, if you're a Buddhist and you're in a solitary confinement, you're happy. <laughs> you just got you know, free, free meals and you could do what you want. But, you know, my brother actually was put in. I mean, this is the least likely person to be put in jail. But somehow he ended up there and he was in solitary confinement. And he... It really messed him up. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, I, I will never say that I'll just be okay. Because, you know, I meditate 18, 20 minutes max, and now I'm done. Uh, we're talking 18, 24 hours. This is a completely different thing. Um, but, I, I mean, I can understand if the mind is well-trained, it's very possible. But I personally could not say that at this moment. I have, I could be in solitary more than 68 hours without going cuckoo on some level i was in a well, and... hospital so yeah it was extremely yeah. challenging and i would not wish that on anyone or myself again uh, however yeah. if it were to befall me then i would take refuge in the practice and i would have you know yeah. there'd be no choice and i'd be grateful that the practice is here and that, it, that the buddha's method would you know and 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 i Absolutely. have been in a mental institution since practicing through Dhamma and was very grateful for being able to advert attention to the breath at the times that I was able to, even though it wasn't constant because of physical and mental challenges while I was in the mental institution. But uh, yeah, there's oh. no... Uh, no way that I would ever want anyone or myself to be in, especially that condition in prison. So what I wouldn't wish that on most? you. What is the, the overwhelming feeling? Uh, oh, sorry, I was break? saying, what is the overwhelming feeling that you get when you're in that uh, solitary <laughs> confinement? Is it just the loneliness? Or is it something else? <laughs> Uh, I suppose it's lack of freedom, the lack of that yeah. you do. I guess it's supposedly um, 
That's a good question. A good question. It depends on the state of the mind. The answer to that question depends on the state of the mind. Uh, yeah. When the question is yeah. asked, so that's going to vary. Yeah. Uh, the the, the um, closer to equanimity or uh, calm that the mind is, then the, the better the state of the body. Uh, the longer one could be in any challenging state, mental or physical. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, the Buddha never uh, told us to go into solitary confinement by choice. No. <laughs> the solitude. Well, okay. actually, solitude is, uh, actually, the reason solitary confinement was on my mind is because um, I was going to relate it to uh, the experience of, of the jhanas, especially the um, the ayatanas that, that kind of branch out of the fourth jhana. And uh, Brett, I would, you know, maybe you can comment when I put this forth. But, um, you know, Bhante Hunyaji's framework for the jhanas is that, you know, the first four jhanas are a complete cooling and stilling of, of, of the emotional part of the mind, the chitta. Um, it becomes stilled, absolutely completely stilled. Um, and that... Um, the emotional reactivity is craving and that the the clinging is 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 those patterns of tension identification storiation that our mind does in response to that um so when the when the chitta is completely stilled that that craving and clinging doesn't arise um so that's sort of a prerequisite to the ayatanas where um it's a stilling of the perceptual system right um one by what layer by layer um layer by layer you know, the, the cognitive and the perceptual processes just still, essentially. Um, but because the emotional system has been stilled in the first four jhanas, there's no panic attack, there's no anxiety attack. You can remain present and aware and see the cessation of, of basically of, of how the mind functions. And what that does is it breaks the, it breaks the virtual reality I mean, it's it's terrible calling it that. That's a that's a bad way of putting it. But you get to see basically how the process of perception um, creates a representation of the world for you to live in. As as Damrado says, what we are contacted with, what we're impacted by, is the salayatana, not the reality. The internal representations that the process of perception creates is actually what contacts the mind, and not uh, the initial sense data. Um, something they know in studies in psychology is that um, our experience of the world is always a couple seconds in the past, actually, um, that um, the world that we're impacted by has already been processed before it's been presented to us. But anyway, when you get into, into the ayatanas, the, the, um, these break down. Um, and what I was going to propose is that um, you don't actually have to go into the jhanas and the ayatanas for for your your perceptual process to break down you just have to stop feeding it its fuel this is why in zen they sit and stare at a blank wall because they're not feeling the senses um so in solitary confinement this is you're experiencing the breakdown of your reality but without having cooled the emotional system so the response to that is psychosis a lot of people experience a psychosis um and if you if you kind of slide into the ayatanas without having slid it without having cooled the chitta first without having cooled the emotional system that's usually what you feel like a tense fear like a grasping you feel it in your gut um and your your breath will get really tight um and there's this total fear response um so i was just contrasting those two experiences in, in my mind earlier um that um yeah, I mean, somebody who's well trained in the Dhamma, who maybe have been put in solitary confinement, they would experience a breakdown of of the way that their mind processes the world because there's not, you know, there's not the conversations that you're having, um, you know, uh, there's there's not the YouTube videos that you listen to, there's not the normal habits of of life that you're doing, there's not the social interactions, all of these things that sort of that you know you're putting into your processor that create your world 
um, are not being put in there. So it begins to break down. And be, but because there's no training and there's no cooling of the emotional system, this is why solitary confinement is such torture to people. Um, but um, yeah, progression through the jhanas is, is sort of like a is 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 that same experience. It breaks down, but you've cooled your emotional system before it breaks down. Breaks down, then it comes back up again, and you basically get a how it's made um, uh, education on the perceptual process. And then with that, and but that's all that's all just for the purpose of non grasping, right? Um, everything that is in the Buddha's teachings are it's, these aren't things that you need to aspire to. You don't need to aspire right. to higher jhanas. You don't need to aspire mm-hmm. to understand all the suttas. Um, you actually, if you're a very, very easy student you don't have to aspire to anything because every all 17,500 suttas really come back to just convincing a mind to stop craving and clinging it all comes back to that to dukkha dukkha naroda um they're just different it's just different ways of convincing the mind to put down what it's holding um so that it can enjoy the bliss of freedom and uh that's why this repetition of Everything is okay exactly as it is. You know, uh, there's nothing that I need to do. There's no job that needs to be done. It undermines craving right there, just in that thought process. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't need to, you don't need to go through through the jhanas to to convince the mind to let go. Um, it just depends on how stubborn your grasping is, I guess. <laughs> uh, bingo. <laughs> Which, if you're an intellectual person, your grasping is quite stubborn, you know. Um, yeah. But there's other reasons why. There's other reasons why giving up craving and clinging is difficult. I mean, the Buddha says it's the most difficult thing in the world. Um, so maybe he was overstating, but apparently it is. <laughs> Jhana is really important in order for someone to give up on the one thing, right? Like, you, you need to experience the jhana more and more to really see the worldly pleasure has nothing on hold, uh, nothing compared to that. Yeah, I mean, some people... Possibly. Some people are not too... Uh turned on by certain things. My wife's never been into drinking. Her friends have been trying to convince her to drink for the past 20 years, and she's just not interested. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just one, You're one, a lucky one. man, sir. You're a lucky man. Yeah. Um, she's, also, she's also lets go very easily. She sees, you know, one night out where our friend drank too much and had like a, went into a really dark state of mind. She was like, not for me. You know, so some people just one little. Uh, that's that's the story that somebody was telling the other day. There's a sutta about the horse. You know, the purebred, thoroughbred horse. I think oh, Brett yeah. wrote it actually. Um, in that's one of the calls that I was listening to. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the most stubborn horse only will change its course when the whip cracks its skin to the point of splitting it open. Right. But right. the, the the well trained the, the 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 very nibbanad horse the cooled horse um, will change its course uh, just at the shadow of the whip, and I think that the shadow of the whip is even the second to last. I think it's just the last the easiest horse is just like a gesture towards the whip. Like, uh, you know, I don't even need to bring out the whip. You just you just kind word. <laughs> so we're all different, you know. Um, some of us need to be whipped and some of us need to just see the hand move towards the whip or just see the shadow of the whip and we'll give up our clinging. Um, so that, Hopefully that's you're the point. horse with good paramis. Yeah, with the good paramis, yeah. Paramis. Um, no, it's spelled with a P, but I think the Thais pronounce it with a B, but anyway. <laughs> okay. So parami, parami is probably correct, but as the Thais always call it barami, but anyway. Barami. Anyway, that might be other... a, a BP there, but neither here nor there. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, any other questions about practice? Um, uh, no, just uh, I, I just have a quick one. Um, I, I kind of just switch in between the first horse and the last horse sometimes. And sometimes all I need is like a gentle word to myself, and then I can, I can see that yeah, everything's okay. Don't have to want anything. Sometimes I need to shed all the whip. Mm. Sometimes it's really I need to clench my jaw and you know to resist it all by any means. It's it's hard to really tell, uh, but. It, it it gets easier to really tell what sit in what situation I need what sort of um way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like I get more and more into that. Okay, in this situation, all I need is some gentle word. I don't have to do too much effort. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm trying to ask. I'm just kind of reflecting, I guess. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's also different depending on the attachment. Um, yes. You know, some attachments are strong and some are weak. So some might just need the shadow of the whip to relinquish and some might need a repeated lashing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you can only break the cycle right now. You you can't necessarily control if it comes back up again or not. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was poignant. Yes, poignant yeah. indeed. One thing I've always respected about Domrado is is always bringing it back to right now. That's easy to forget, and it's but it's so significant, and important to remember. It's always about this thought, right? This thought is our entire world. So it's the thought that you're having right now. That's the entire universe. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Just this thought. Really, it's very calming just to say it. Yes. Something that Mara thought that helped me a lot was uh, he said, I don't have to fix my whole life. I just have to, um, I'm kind of paraphrasing, like make this moment good enough, something like that. So it, mm -hmm. it just kind of brings my attention to what needs to be done now. I don't have to fix my, like, there's too much work, which kind of, it's the right effort, like, you know, too too much effort is wrong effort. No. It makes sense. Uh, sometimes it sounds like Dhammarado's got his own interpretation of the Dhamma, but if you look at the suttas after you get it, he's he he's not wrong. Like um one sutta I was obsessed with for the wrong reasons that I now love for the right reasons is uh, MN sixty four. And I'm just there's only one part of it that's relevant to what you're saying here. Um, which is the Buddha says that, you know, when, after getting into the first jhana, if you attend to the deathless, you can give up all fetters. Uh, but if not, you just get you just get rid of the lower five, and then you'll get rid of the rest in the future. But the point about that is that he's telling us that we can just give it up. And that's like, that's what Damarado is telling us, right? Is like, you don't have to like do all these things to earn liberation. Like you can actually just decide to give it up. And and Ivan, what I was thinking about with you is um, in relation to it's just this thought is that whenever you think that, oh, I have this whole history or I have this pattern or, you know, yesterday yes. was good and today it's bad and tomorrow might be bad. All of that is connected to identity view, right? That's all. Yes. That's all like the belief system about this is me. This is mine. This is who I am. And right now in this moment, in this thought, you can just give that up. And you could just yes. be okay just for this thought, you know? Yeah. And then oh, yeah. and then you keep repeating that. <laughs> but you can just give it up. You can just put it down. Um, stop caring about it, as Damarado would say. You know, the relinquishment of Klingon in Damarado languages. Stop caring about that, you know? Yes. Yes. Well, that's how liberation Perfect. can occur from talks. Listening to a mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. There's a there's there's a beautiful sutta in the Anguta and the Anguttara Nikaya the An I can't remember what number it is but it's about uh five ways to access jhana and the first one is about um 
listening to a talk and how if the student is really enjoying the talk, then they'll be put in the first jhana just listening to the talk. Um, mm. Because while you're absorbed in talking about the Dhamma, thinking about the mm. Dhamma, talking about the Dhamma, reflecting on the Dhamma, these are all the different ways they discuss, um, then the hindrances cease while you're doing that because the Dhamma mm. is reality and the hindrances, they don't, they don't have access to this present moment. They're, they all exist in the conceptual past and future and conceptualized present. But the, you know, so, um, yeah, that's why, the, you know, you get to experience jhana without realizing it just while you're enjoying a good discussion on the Dhamma with a bunch of good Dhamma friends. Nice. Right. So much. Sense. Indeed, indeed. Uh, dude, uh, dude. <laughs> I, I, so, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, um, so when you're think, talking about that, uh, something came out in my mind, which is, I think, my hindrance. So I, I would just like to know what are the advice. So, you know, like on the idea of letting go and, uh, you know, dropping the thoughts. You know, my my mini ego keeps saying, right, how many times do I have to do this? Do, do you guys experience something like this? So th is that the thought you're expressing? How many times do I have to do this? Uh, yeah, I, I think it is, a, it is a hindrance, but I think it comes up quite often, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely a hindrance. Um, and it's a common one. I used to think that. I mean, that was the first thing I thought when I... I never encountered someone who said, I have one wholesome thought after another. You know, I was like, what? I'm not going to freaking do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, before you realize how easy it becomes. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let the mind, I'm not going to take over this mind. I'm going to let it do whatever it wants to do and hope for the best. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sit down for, you know, three times a day and hope the mind fixes itself. But anyway, um, or like when it's working, it's like how many times? Yeah. Anyway, the point is that, yeah, that's 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 definitely, I would say, at least the hindrance of doubt. How many times do we have to do this? It's it's, you know, something that you don't know. Um, and then maybe ill will, like becoming irritated with the practice. But let's just look at it as the hindrance of doubt um, and coming back to Damarado, something he says, I, I used to think he just does this to frustrate people, but I think it's just what he says um, in response to speculative questions. He says, I don't know. And I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the cessation of doubt. That's the cessation okay. of doubt. I don't know. And I don't care. Right. Doubt can't persist without clinging to wanting to know, right? Um, because all you know is just this thought, just this moment, 